Hello, greetings everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Early Grade Reading Program Design and Implementation webinar series where we'll be discussing best practices and resources for success. We are really excited to be providing this webinar series um, through the Reading Within Reach initiative in collaboration with the Global Reading Network. My name is Allison Swepson. I'm the Reading Program Specialist with REACH, and I'm uh, working with a team of wonderful collaborators on this. Today we have Amy, who is our technical advisor based in Tanzania, and she's going to walk us through an introduction to the early grade reading um, series. Um, welcome once again, wherever you are. I know in the United States it's the day after the Halloween holiday, so folks might be still trickling in and joining us. Um, we have quite a number of people who have expressed interest in this webinar series since we announced we would be developing it. Um, as I mentioned, this series is being developed by Reading Within Reach, which is funded by the United States Agency for International Development and, and implemented by a university research company, or URC, which is where um, we're based right now today. Uh, REACH is an initiative that supports a variety of activities related to research around early grade reading, trialing of innovations like enabling writers, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, we also provide training and professional development and resources for those supporting early grade reading programs globally. Um, so one of our initiatives is to provide um, resources and opportunities related to early grade reading programming. And we've done this to date um, several times, beginning at the CIS conference in Mexico. We've also delivered a workshop recently, just last week, here in our office to early grade reading program implement implementers. And as I said, we're excited to offer this online now to a wider global audience. Um, if you'd like to learn more about REACH and uh, everything that the GRN is doing, you can visit our website where you can also sign up to get our newsletters and other communications if you don't receive them already. Um, the webinar series in November will be presented by myself. Um, Amy, as I mentioned, is based in Tanzania. RSR Limo, our REACH Training and Curriculum Specialist, who is also based in Tanzania. And Adrian Barnes and Marion Fessmeyer of Florida State University. So the goal of this webinar series, or the purpose, is to provide participants with evidence-based information, guidance, and resources to support the design and implementation of effective early grade reading programs. We've heard from many of you that there's a lot of information out there, but it's not always in one place. So we're looking to put that together to share with you the latest and greatest research, the experiences that programs um, are having, and some resources that you can have to support your work. Each session this month is focused on a key technical topic, and it includes a summary of the evidence to date, um, case studies and other experiences from different countries, and also some of the best practices, resources, and tools that we have received from programs and that we've also um, created for you to summarize uh, some of those best practices. We'll be exploring some of the cross-cutting issues that we know are integral to the success of these programs around gender equity, use of technology, designing programs that are inclusive for all learners. So we don't have modules specifically on that, as you may have noticed, but it's because, of course, it's something that we don't want to see as tacked out to programs, but we feel needs to be integrated throughout. I will also be addressing issues related to monitoring evaluation um, as we go along, because we think these need to be addressed uh, for each of the topical areas. And then in the last session, we will be bringing it all together <clears throat> where we discuss some issues related to monitoring and evaluation of programs generally. And that's when we'll also be touching on scale up and sustainability, which will be addressed with three specific component area as well. Although this is a webinar and there is uh, obviously a dynamic um, where we aren't all in the same room to have the type of discussion that we might be used to in a training setting, we are striving to provide opportunities for interaction and questions. So we've built-in opportunities for um, questions and answers, also small group work virtually, um, and other, other strategies that we hope this will not just be a lecture series, but really um, a professional development opportunity to share um, experiences. So as I mentioned, we have six webinars uh, this month, the Introduction to Early Grade Reading Improvement today. Our second webinar on November 6th will be about resources for teaching and learning early grade reading. Um, and in that 
uh, webinar, we'll be exploring the different types of materials that are used. We'll be looking at characteristics of effective resources. We'll also be spending quite a bit of time talking about the materials development process. We know we've been doing this work for quite a long time, and we've learned much about how to do it efficiently and to produce high quality materials. So we'll be sharing some of those best practices from programs, as well as tools that they use to manage that process. We'll be also looking at how to make materials appropriate, inclusive, and accessible for diverse learners. Um, in the third workshop, we'll be specifically exploring the different skills and strategies for teaching uh, early grade reading and also talking about classroom-based assessment. This webinar is going to bring together a couple of different panelists um, who will be um, sharing some of their work and um, an opportunity to ask them questions about everything you ever wanted to know about the nuts and bolts of uh, early grade reading instruction. Um, as we get into the later part of mid middle part of November, we'll explore more about language considerations in early grade reading programs. We know from talking to all of you that language is a critical issue in our programs, whether it's material development, the skills we teach, and how we teach them, and how that may vary across languages. So we'll be taking a deeper dive into that topic in the fourth webinar. Then we'll be exploring teacher professional development, including pedagogical coaching. And we will be talking about the different modalities of teacher professional development. We'll be looking at some of the evidence around the effectiveness of coaching and the different models of coaching that are being used. And we'll be talking about some of the best practices so far that programs have found related to teacher PD and coaching and early grade reading programs. Um, last, we will round out the month by bringing it all together to talk about program design, um, expanding programs at scale, and also all the considerations that we need to think about as we aim for programs to be sustainable. So if you haven't already registered for these and you're interested in doing so, the um, website where you can do so is below. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Amy, who's in Tanzania. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Allison, and I appreciate everybody who's participating today. We're going to begin today with um, just an introduction to early reading improvement. This is a short session today. More, our sessions will generally be two hours. This session is only one hour. And so if we can take a look at the objectives, take a look, please, at the objectives for this introductory session. Most of the people who are registered here for this workshop are registered likely because you know that uh, improving early grade reading outcomes for children around the world is a, is a critical foundational goal for education, for community and social development, for economic development um, in, in all countries, particularly in low and middle income countries. And so part of what we'll look at today is the importance of improving reading outcomes and why that should be something that is a target focus for all of us who are working in education. Um, we're also going to be looking at how early grades reading fits into larger efforts for improving the quality of education, uh, where we've come so far in terms of the focus with the Millennium Development Goals and on into Sustainable Development Goals uh, internationally for improvement of reading. And then also specific to USAID programming, the common core components, how to think about program design and program implementation, and some of the cross-cutting issues that need to be addressed in any early grades reading programs. We want to encourage you throughout the session today um, to post your questions. And we'd like you to use the Q&A box in Zoom. And while I'm working with you, Allison and Stephanie will be monitoring that box. And we'll have periods of time where we stop, we take some questions, we respond. We also are going to be using the chat function today, asking you to work in the chat function as well to share some of your experiences with us. So let's take a look first of all at the relationship between reading and the larger issue of literacy. For many years, um, in terms of large-scale program implementation, we've talked about reading programs, but we always have been working on bolstering all of those skills that are interrelated inside literacy. Not only reading, but reading to support writing, writing to support reading, the foundational skills of speaking and listening that feed into skills development for both reading and writing. 
And of course, these are made dynamic in many ways and brought together in many ways around using technology, developing technology skills, and all of this promoting the concepts of critical thinking. So using our reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills to be able to gain information, communicate information, apply technology to support that work, and engage in critical thinking about our work, our lives, and our educational experiences. For the, the workshop series, for this webinar series, we will be actually using the terms reading and literacy in many interchangeable kinds of ways. So when we talk about reading, we may be speaking specifically about particular elements of reading instruction, but you will also hear us reference literacy quite a lot as a larger focus of our work. So our initial goal for the brief workshop today, why focus on improving early grades reading? Fundamentally, what we're really talking about is the first and most important skill that children need to master to be able to be successful in school, uh, along with numeracy as well. Understanding number, understanding language, being able to use language to access information, communicate what we know. Whether we're accessing through listening or reading, communicating through speaking or writing, it's critical that we build these basic skills for young learners. They're unable to access more difficult content as they move forward if they don't have basic literacy skills. It has a huge impact on their academic trajectory and also economic outcomes as adults in the work world. The problem that we know exists everywhere, and particularly in the poorest countries, is that in the poorest countries, these children are the least likely to be able to access quality, quality literacy instruction and the least likely to be able to be fluent in literacy by the end of early grades primary, which we consider to be third grade. So if a student is exiting third grade without the basic skills that they need, the programs for children's learning turn from learning to read and learning to write to using reading writing to learn content. And if they're unable to access those basic skills, they begin to almost immediately miss out in other academic ways. And this is something that many of you will know of as the Matthew effect. They get behind in early grades and they continue to get further and further behind as they move forward in school. So you can see that children who learn to read in early primary have a much more rapid learning trajectory and much higher level of reading achievement and general content success as each year goes by. And those who do not attain those basic skills in the first three years continue to get further and further behind because the foundational skills are not there for them to apply to access content information, and they're not there for them to apply to more complex literacy skills that are required as text becomes more complex and the content of that complex of that text becomes more complex as well. Um, so you might think about it from an economic point of view, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and stay poor. Um, so while there are some intensive interventions in the later grades that can help older students catch up in some ways, um, they're very limited in terms of their effectiveness. They're incredibly costly to do. Um, and so the best approach is for us to get to these children in grades one and two and up to grade three to make sure that they have the good foundational skills that they need before they move forward. So now we want you to take a little bit of time to reflect on this question. We want to know about the work that you're doing. So we can see some information from Shelley, who's working in a program in Liberia, where they have actually had to expand their phonics program into upper primary grades in order to try and backstop some of those skills that students have not achieved in the very early grades, which of course, we know that this can be helpful to many students. It also, though, creates a, a slowdown effect for students in other areas as well when they should be spending their literacy time developing other skills. But of course, if students do not have the basic skills for decoding of text, then it's a necessary intervention. And so I guess um, in terms of the work in Liberia, one of the things that 
I think Shelly and her colleagues could be looking for is over time, if this kind of expanded phonics intervention can continue to then go in the other direction and shrink over time as students move up in grade levels and those very young learners start entering grades three, four, and five with better foundational skills. We also have Lisa here from STS. And Lisa, is, they're focusing at STS on inclusive practice, on this issue of addressing the learning needs of all children, inclusion in terms of gender, uh, students with disabilities, and uh, using an approach that is not a narrow focused approach, but provides entry points for students who may be behind and challenge points for students who may be ready to move forward. So some really good examples. We've got Mark with the Queen Rania Foundation and looking at working with the RAMP program. Uh, we also have some comments on approaching early grades literacy in mother tongue to make sure that students have an adequate capacity to learn to read, write, speak, and listen in their own mother tongue before they're shifted into uh, a second language for instruction. And we have someone who's working with a youth program, which is very interesting because this person says they're seeing the Matthew effect in their own work. Students who are older, who don't have strong literacy skills, and who are working now to kind of multitask their own learning, building those literacy skills at the same time, and I assume through work and life skills development. An example from Cameroon, again, focused on mother tongue. We have a very specific strategy from Farida um, using story cards so that students are also learning at home. And this idea of providing simple home materials, sometimes not even written materials, um, that they can use with parents in the home to develop oral language and to develop early reading skills. And in this case, um, I believe it's in mother tongue, yes. And an interesting comment from Rosemary in terms of looking at the graph, the idea that students may begin at the same point and then things start to move away from one another. Um, it, and I think, Rosemary, you're making an excellent point that even though we visibly see students who all of whom may come to school where we assume they have basic foundational language, um, nutrition, health, and home support, we almost immediately find out that there are other factors that influence this as well, which is why we really have to look at the needs of the whole child. It loops back to the issue of inclusive strategies as well. So not only do early grades teachers need to know how to teach basic skills, they also need to know how to identify when those basic skills are not evident through continuous assessment, but they also have to know their children so that they can address some of those other underlying factors that can also interfere with students' abilities to move forward in terms of skills development. Taking a look at the global movement and what's, what's going on and why. So when we all really started this focus in, on a global scale with UN Sustainable Development Goals, we were looking at a lot of goals that were focused on increasing access. So increasing geographical access, increasing the number of schools, increasing the numbers of children who were in schools, increasing the amount of resources that were there for students as well. So a lot of focus early on on making sure that access was available for students, even though we talked a lot about effective learning outcomes. But one of the things we did find, and I think everyone finds when they're working in access programs, is that access is really insufficient and it's about quality. Um, it becomes about quality. So even when you have sufficient access for students, then the biggest barrier becomes, do we have teachers who are prepared to teach the students who are now in the classroom? Do we have resources that are quality resources designed and targeted for the specific students who are using them. Um, so when we look at the sustainable development goals, we're really starting to talk about measuring minimum proficiency. So we're past access at this point, and we're really focused on the kind of quality instruction and resources that support students to meet a basic threshold of proficiency for literacy. Um, there are many agencies working 
to support this work. And USAID has actually been a big leader in the movement to improve early grade reading results. Um, it, uh, the USAID programs use a very simple evidence-based approach. Uh, it's flexible to different contents, contexts, um, and it can improve learning achievement for students as well. So we talked a bit at the beginning of the session about why early grades reading. And with the shift from the uh, MDGs to the SDGs in terms of access to quality, we know that we really have to try and dig down through the large education systems inside developing countries to get to what happens in the classroom, uh, to know how to go straight to the teacher in the most efficient and effective ways. And this is really a balancing act between providing sufficient structure and guidance but also supporting and promoting the ongoing learning of teachers, the ongoing uh, continuous assessment in classrooms, response to the direct evidence that is in front of teachers as they're working with students. One of the things we do know is that we know the basic approach that works for teaching children to read. Now, in different cultural contexts, in different language contexts, uh, these approaches, of course, have to be adapted, but they're adapted in terms of language, they're adapted in terms of resources, but the fundamental skills that are necessary to teach children to read are pretty much universal. Um, and so we no longer have to look at and think about and study what's the best way to teach reading. We know how to do that. So now the focus needs to be on making sure that these programs that are out there working in countries are finding effective strategies to get to the grassroots level of the work. And one of the things that we'll be focused on in every single one of the webinar series is how do you do that? How do you manage programs at the large upper end level, very large programs that need to be designed from the beginning for potential scale up and sustainability, working with thousands of schools, thousands of teachers, and how do you also make that influence at the great, at the classroom level so that teachers and students have opportunity to see what works, to engage in good practice. Um, and when teachers see something and try something that works with students, they'll adopt those strategies. And we know if we're using those simple strategies that students will learn to read. So the READ Act, Reinforcing Education Accountability and Development, became law in 2017, and it builds on the ongoing efforts to make sure that more than 200 million children and youth who aren't in school get in school and to prove the, improve the equality of education for those who are in school. One of the biggest focuses of this READ Act, though, is to also build sustainability of programs. And of course, that requires building sustainability of the existing actor institutions in the country. So that's Ministry of Education, it's other supporting local networks and local systems that make sure uh, these programs that are tested and trialed through external funding, donor funding, can be continued on where the capacity exists to continue it at the country systems level. So along with this READ Act, we now have um, a new government strategy that was just released in September of this year. And this government strategy, again, is moving from this issue of access and into the issue of outcomes uh, for quality education. And that's for all students, but there is a particular emphasis in the government strategy around marginalized and vulnerable populations. This may be subpopulations and culture, uh, cultural subpopulations that have been traditionally excluded. It could be students with disabilities. Um, it could be children who are living in extended um, conflict and crisis zones, uh, those who are marginalized and vulnerable. And along with this new strategy, um, USA just released a draft policy last month um, and released that for comment, so it is not yet a finalized policy but they are taking comments on this policy that is actually quite exciting for people who are in the education field working in developing countries. 
So our, the first, uh, this is a, just a summary of what is a very long document with lots of detail. But what we tried to do is pull up out of the extended detail, the large kind of umbrella areas of work that are a part of this new draft USAID policy. And again, we're looking at focusing work on marginalized and vulnerable children um, and youth, which means we're really talking about more than early grades children and more than youth workforce development but more of a vertically aligned set of focus uh, on students who are marginalized and vulnerable, making sure they not only get quality education, but they get it in a context that's relevant for them, that also addresses issues of social well-being, because we know marginalized and vulnerable children don't just need good skills and content, they also need a lot of social emotional support, um, and in a safe environment. So that's a very big goal, and that will likely, in terms of implementation, take many, many um, different images in terms of implementation. Uh, the second bullet is very exciting because we now have numeracy there as a partner for literacy. Um, and so particularly <coughs> in early grades, uh, integrating numeracy and literacy into larger scale programming for early grades is, is likely to be a major focus as we move forward. Youth skills development, that workforce transition for, for youth who are uh, exiting school or out of school youth moving into the workforce. And then the last bullet, which focuses on higher education institutions. Now, when we think about higher ed education institutions, we might be thinking about post-secondary experiences for learners when they leave secondary school and move into higher education. But also inside this draft policy is a very strong emphasis on pre-service teacher training programs. So higher education institutions engagement, not only on the back end of the education cycle for the child, but on the front end of the preparation cycle for teachers. This is a bit of a change in the past primarily um, large donor programs have been focused on in-service for teachers. And so um, this community who's participating in this webinar today is likely very excited to see that there's going to be support and emphasis on working directly with pre-service institutions. By helping those pre-service institutions be better prepared to train teachers, we should be looking at over a 10 to 15 year period reduction in the need for ongoing in-service for teachers after they're in schools and a more efficient way to target necessary funding to particular problems that exist in schools with education quality and access. So it's a very exciting new draft policy. So along with the draft policy, USAID is looking at um, organizing its program design requests, program requests for proposals, pro uh, implementing design and implementation process around a new set of global structures, what they're calling the mosaic. There's some expected things in this mosaic, the issue of having policies and standards that not only don't block effective implementation, but enable it. So making sure that programs are working well integrated with ministries of education as partners to ensure that policies and standards at the national level are consistent with opening pathways for children to learn. High quality texts and materials, this has been an ongoing piece of work and conversation and we're going to be doing on Tuesday an extended webinar on how to address this issue in terms of development. Effective teachers, um, I particularly like the inclusion now of school leadership in terms of pedagogical leadership in schools. Uh, those of us who work in reading programs know that you can train teachers, but if you have a school leader who is unprepared to support that work or to enable it, um, the sustainability of the approach for teachers doesn't last very long. A very exciting piece that's brought itself to the forefront is this effective teacher coaching and mentoring. In previous program approaches, the focus has been primarily on training with coaching and mentoring happening in many, many places, but happening kind of as a secondary, secondary influence in a program. So to bring coaching and mentoring up to the forefront as one of the six core pillars for program design is a very exciting change. Continuous assessment is here. 
Uh, it tends to get integrated underneath effective teachers. So it is nice to see it as a standout piece um, where we will have the opportunity as program implementers to build very rigorous continuous assessment approaches, test out different tools and models, and be able to come together as a community, for example, through Global Reading Network to share what it is that's working with teachers. While we know continuous assessment is critical, it's also one of the most difficult components of instructional practice to help teachers understand how to manage, particularly in large classrooms, and to help them understand what to do with the information that they receive in that continuous assessment. And the last pillar, regular reading practice outside of school. So we're talking about that connection back to the community and home as a core structure of the work. So that will be, this mosaic is going to be USAID's new kind of overarching program design structure for the, the request for proposals and the program implementations going forward. Now, this is not only for reading. Um, Global Reading Network is also doing some work with USAID at this point in time to address this issue of the mosaic for numeracy at early grades as well and integrated programming, literacy, numeracy, and social emotional well-being. So along with these six pillars, of course, we've got the underlying cross-cutting issues and you can see them on the screen now. So if you think about the six pillars of the mosaic, these cross-cutting issues circle and move around across those six pillars. So reaching marginalized populations, reaching marginalized populations through coaching, reaching marginalized populations through community engagement, reaching marginalized populations through effective and, and contextual materials and resources. So these are the cross-cutting issues. They're not going away. They are, as Allison pointed out early in the webinar, they are integrated across all of the components of a comprehensive reading program. So this is from USAID, um, and it shows uh, what we have accomplished so far. So 69.8 million students reached, but only outcomes measured for only 28 million for a sampling of those students. So if you look from our first blue bar down to our blue and white bar, measuring outcomes for 28 million, and then taking a look at the number of students who showed significant reading improvement, about 15%. So we've made some progress. I think we've learned a lot of lessons. But of course, there is a very, very long way to go. One of the things that we know now, uh, one of the larger lessons or set of lessons that we've learned is what are some of the gaps that need to be thought about and gaps that exist in programs. So in taking a look at the evaluations for early grades reading programs, they found gaps in particular areas, and these will not surprise you. So there were statistically significant improvement in terms of student skills and also the instruction that teachers provided, but the gains were really small and the effect sizes were really small. So uh, the approaches and the programs had an effect on students, but the gains were very tiny. There, there were not a lot of um, massive improvements. So for example, reductions in zero scores, increases in for some students in uh, component literacy performance, but of course when you get to the larger issues, for example, monitor, uh, measuring comprehension, then the gains began to fall away as you move from the component skill areas into the more comprehensive skill application. So in terms of resources, there's been a lot of production and delivery of materials, but there are also operational problems with that. Um, material, good quality materials take quite some time to produce um, and require a, a very extensive amount of planning in order to produce really good quality materials. And usually resources tended to be quite delayed in programs. So even while teacher training may have proceeded on, teachers could be returning to classrooms without the resources they needed to support the new uh, approaches, the new pedagogical approaches they were using. And in terms of teacher PD and coaching, there seems to not be much evidence between 
the relation between teachers participating in in-service and how much in-service training they received and what type and the effect on student learning. There wasn't a lot of relationship uh, seen there. So there needs to be some rethinking and some more examination about what kind of teacher professional, professional development do we provide, what's the extent of that, what is it focused on, and where is it located? So it takes us to this issue of coaching. Um, you know, cascade models that work from the top down could, can be efficient when you're dealing with large numbers of teachers, but they may not always be the most effective. And so then it comes to this question of coaching. There's a lot of trouble even gathering evidence on, on, about coaching and the effect of coaching. It was not a priority in programs for some time, but there is a lot of um, ancillary evidence and anecdotal evidence, which is always where we begin when we want to study something more, that says that those programs that are locally situated, both in terms of training, coaching, teacher study groups, are the programs where teachers build the best instructional skills, see the most change for students, and sustain that work over a longer period of time. So additional gaps to think about. The theories of change that were applied in terms of what was looked at with reading programs, they, there was really a lack of clear causal pathways. So there, there wasn't a lot of evidence that could be gathered that answered the question, when gains happened in these particular areas, why did they happen? Or when they did not happen, why did they not happen? Another thing that was seen in the evaluations is that the design of programs didn't actually always fit the context of the situation. And while we do know how to teach reading and, and we do know how to implement large scale programs, um, we have to be able to do that within the authentic context of the setting, particularly for any kind of long-term scale-up and sustainability. If we're working with designs that are, not, um, that are not well integrated to the existing structures in the country, and if we're working to desi with designs that don't fit the actual context, they will not be able to out-survive uh, the presence of temporary uh, pilot programs in countries. And the last thing, programs that were designed and in terms of measurement and evaluation, that we were only really looking at cumulative effects over time. We weren't looking at the qualitative um, ongoing collection of program data that informed the program. And actually, if you read back up these bullets, that could take a look at how programs were fitting in the context, that could take a look at those causal pathways and causal relationships as well. That's the basic set of information for this particular webinar. And for more information, you can see on the screen now that um, you can check out the resource that's listed there. And you've got a link as well. And we'd like you to do two pieces of reflection for us today. If you've got any questions about what was talked about today, and then in the chat function, we'd like you to look forward. Allison shared with you the topics of the six workshops. We'd like you to look forward across the, those main topics um, and let us know what are the particular things that you need as a learner, uh, as a participant in the workshop series, in the webinar series, uh, what kinds of things would you most want to know about? This will help us as we continue planning for these webinars. Yeah, a question that came through actually on the chat box about the Matthew effect. So what we're talking about with the Matthew effect is really a fairly basic concept that the longer children are in school, those who do not develop basic skills early on fall farther and farther behind other students. So if you look at the graph, you may see that children at grade one, they may come for all intents and purposes, similarly prepared for school. Basic community literacy experiences um, in a similar context, in a similar area, students who come relatively prepared and relatively the same at the same level. However, there are students who will immediately begin to fall behind if teachers are not providing uh, effective instruction in the component skills areas or if students have a particular learning need that is not identified and addressed through continuous assessment and remediation and response. 
And those children who fail to master those early basic component skills like graphophonemic awareness, like the ability to decode basic vocabulary, like the understanding of uh, like even text awareness and the understanding of how to deal with text in terms of comprehension. Those children will go further and further behind their peers as each year goes by. So they don't get behind and then that effect ends and they continue to move forward at a lower level. They actually fall farther and farther behind over time. We have a question from Elke around the idea of activities designed as a package, which uh, only allowed for summative cumulative evaluation. Um, some of the uh, moral approaches to the larger reading programs really were very basic, and that's because they were very large in many cases. Pre-assessment of a sampling of students, mid-assessment of a sampling of students, and post-assessment of a sampling of students over what's essentially a five-year period. And so what it didn't allow, um, was there, there were not necessarily, there was not necessarily support or planning inside programs for ongoing programmatic level data gathering. Uh, that in many cases would have been more qualitative than quantitative, but would also have begun to really address those causal relationship questions. You know, when teachers provide this amount of instruction per week, this is the effect on student learning. That's an example. Or when resources are locally developed as opposed to repurposed from other programs, is there an effect and what is the effect on student learning? So this packaged approach really was a very large-scale approach that wasn't able to honor that ongoing data collection that might be necessary to further inform the details of why programs work and do not work. Uh, we also have a question from Herrings of the six pillars on the mosaic. Is there a pillar that has a bigger effect than others? Um, well, first of all, I need to say this is a new structural approach for USAID. So even in USAID programs, these pillars and how they work have not been tested out. But um, I believe, uh, as a person who's, who works in this area, I believe that all six of those pillars are critically important for large-scale comprehensive program success, particularly for building scale-up opportunity and sustainability. Um, and it's based on all of the research that says these are the six critical things that are important. It's not just about pedagogical approach. It's not just about resources. It's not just about family um, and, and access to literacy support outside of the building, but that all six of these are equally critical, which is why um, USAID in particular is asking folks to begin to focus their work around those six pillars and ensure that any program they implement equally and adequately ad addresses all six of them. Um, since we're nearing the end of our time, I'd like to thank Amy for the presentation, and I would also like to thank everyone online for sharing your questions and your experiences. I think these are really going to help further inform our preparations for the next webinars. And when you do join those, we invite more sharing and, and of experiences. Um, this webinar series, as I mentioned, was put together in close collaboration with Global Reading Network members who did share experiences, who gave feedback into the initial content, and who shared resources. So it really is um, very much crowdsourced in that sense, and we're always looking for more experiences and resources. So we'll provide some information on how you can share those with us um, formally as well as during the webinars themselves. Um, as you see here, the next webinar is November 6th from 9 to 11. Um, you can go to the Global Reading Network events page and register for that if you haven't already. Um, again, even if you don't plan to come, that just ensures you also will get any updates as soon as they're available about that particular webinar. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank Amy and all of the crew here at the REACH and the Global Reading Network for supporting this. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the upcoming webinars.